The title may not tell you much about what my, my presentation is about, but bear with me. It's all going to come together. The Sudbury of today is not the Sudbury I grew up in. I want to show you what I mean. This is a photograph taken in the early 1960s, looking across Kelly Lake at the smelter complex in Coppercliff. The town of Coppercliff, where I grew up, is behind that hill, and this is before the era of the Superstack. I want to point out this picture is in color. That's a pretty bleak looking landscape, isn't it? If you think that's bleak, let me show you what my backyard looks like. I grew up in Little Italy, in Coppercliff, and my backyard, this is the landscape, we simply came to know it as the rocks. This is the only subway I knew. And when I show people this picture, People say, oh my God, I'm sorry for you. On the contrary, I, I, it, it brings a smile to my face to see this because as a young teenager, we used to run all over the rocks. There were no fences. And actually, some days we walked so far that we would actually come to a tree line. I challenge you, by the way, to find a single blade of grass in this photograph. Even though it's a little bit out of focus and it's an old photograph, there isn't a blade of grass there. But the subbury of three generations earlier was very different than the subway I grew up in. In 1893, Sudbury officially became a town. A thousand people lived here. They obtained their drinking water from a spring in a gravel pit. And the resource at the time was not what you may think it was. It was not mining. It was logging. Sudbury was at the heart of the largest red and white pine forest in all of North America. The trees that came out of this area went south to rebuild the northern U.S. cities, like Chicago. But in and around that time, someone discovered copper and nickel. And the challenge of the day, especially with Sudbury rocks, was Sudbury ore contains a lot of sulfur. And that sulfur was a barrier to smelting the copper and nickel. So someone came up with the method, well, let's just burn the sulfur off. So I have this vision of miners taking a piece at a time and putting it in a bonfire. No, 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 no. Let me show you what I mean. This is a roast yard. Imagine an area that covers five football fields in length. That is covered by logs as tall as you and I, neatly stacked. And to give you an idea of scale, this black speck is a person standing on that log pile, bending over with his back to us. The roast yards, where then, once the logs were piled on, the ore from the open pits in the mines were piled on top like a horizontal pyramid, and the whole thing was set on fire. A roast yard would burn 24 hours around the clock for up to nine weeks at a time. The smoke coming off that roast yard traveled across the landscape like a killer fog. The sulfur, every time it rained, it became sulfuric acid, a mild form, and every bit of vegetation in its path was killed. I mean, clearly, this is a devastated landscape. By 1928, the first of the stacks was built. It was recognized that the roast yards were quite a danger, a harm to the environment. So they became outlawed, then they began to push the pollution up into the air. So this was 1928, the Copper Cliff Smelter. By 1943, Sudbury was booming. Fifty years after it was founded, 50,000 people were living here. North America came to call Sudbury the nickel capital of the world because we supplied most of the Western world's nickel supply. The town was booming, but all of that prosperity came at a price. The rest of Canada came to call us the city that looked like the moon. And I remember as a young boy walking across these rocks and coming across these tree stumps, and take a look, you can see the roots sticking out of the ground. And I used to think, who brought these stumps here? Why are they here? I, I, I couldn't imagine anything else. But the answer as to why you could see the roots lies in the central stump. You see this faint white line? That, folks, is the soil line. A meter of soil has eroded from the surrounding Sudbury landscape in 100 years. If this was a biology class, I would say this is an extreme example of an industrially disturbed ecosystem. The resource that was here, the industry that was here, totally devastated the landscape. The forest disappeared, the wildlife, even the soil. And the only dirt that was left 
was so full of heavy metals and sulfur that no native vegetation could grow. In the early 60s, on hot summer days, I used to walk across the rocks and go swimming in this lake. It's called Clarabelle. And I have this vision of a particular day when I was walking back from swimming here, and my neighbor, Louis, who was a retired miner, he was in his early 70s, he stopped me in the street and he said, Franco, he says, where are you coming from? I said, Louis, I've just come from swimming from Clarabelle. And this is what he said to me, Clarabelle, he said, oh yes, when I was your age, I used to bring cows grazing here. My response was, Louis, whoa, whoa, I'm talking about Clarabelle. I'm trying to find a blade of grass there. He said, no, no, I used to bring cows grazing there. I didn't say anything else to Louis, but I distinctly remember thinking, Louis is getting old, he's getting a little bit senile. <laughs> Years later, when I went to Laurentian University in a biology class, the professor told us the history of what happened to this place. And at that moment, I had a flashback to Louis' conversation. He was right. The question that comes to my mind and your mind is, why weren't people demonstrating in the streets? Why wasn't my generation out in the streets demonstrating, what the heck is happening here? And you know what? There's a very simple answer. I grew up in this moonscape. The only world I knew was this. I always thought Sudbury was like this. This was my standard. But you may think, well, what about Louis, who had these memories of the past? I think why Louis wasn't demonstrating came down to this. His memories were from three generations earlier. The change from one human generation to the next was so slow that no one truly recognized the loss of the previous. Everything, oh, I want to pretend for a second. This is what your backyard is supposed to look like, old growth red pine, okay? So let's pretend that this is what your back look, backyard looks like, and a year later, it turns to that. What do you think the response would have been then? It's pretty clear. All of us would be demonstrating, not only Siberians, but people from across Canada would say, what the heck is happening in Sudbury, right? But because change happened so slowly, no one generation recognized the loss of the other. In 1970, all of this was supposed to change. The super, super stack was built. The phrase, I still remember it now, dilution is the solution. You get that pollution up there, and we're going to solve our air quality problem. Well, air quality in and around Sudbury became better. Unfortunately, hundreds and thousands of lakes in northeastern Ontario, northern Quebec, became acid dead. We simply exported the problem. This is where the story gets happy. <laughs> In 1977, there was a real shift in thinking. A professor by the name of Keith Winterhalder from Laurentian University had a vision. As a biologist, as an ecologist, he wanted the forest of the red and white pine to return to Sudbury. The challenge was the dirt was full of poison. It was too acidic, too much heavy metals. He came up with a method of simply liming. I say simply. It took a long time for him to figure out how much lime and would it work. So he approached the city of Sudbury and the mining companies, and together, together, it was a collaborative effort, they came up with a plan to regreen Sudbury. So let me show you the product of all of that regreening. In 1978, the mining industry took a downturn. A thousand miners were laid off. They were quickly rehired, and like an army, they traveled across the landscape, spread line by hand, this is before the era of ATVs, and the white you see is not snow, but lime powder. So, let's look at some before and after. This is a photograph of the west end of Sudbury, the end of the street, classic moonscape in the background. So imagine growing up in this environment, where if you go out, you play in the rocks. Same place 22 years later. You now have a green space, beside these homes at the end of the street. So if your child goes into this bush, they would see birds nesting in the trees, possibly a garter snake. And do you know what? Some of these places even have flying squirrels. <laughs> flying squirrels are native to this area, and they're returning. 
Let me show you another area. Classic picture, another part of the city, same place 22 years later. Now, not only was the quality of life improved if you grew up in these neighborhoods, but the prices of the homes rose also. Where before you had a moonscape, bottom rock price for your house, you now have a green space right beside your homes. That changed also. My favorite, though, is these two more pictures. This one was taken by Keith Winterhalder, and the one I'm going to show you from three years ago was taken by Stephen Monet from the city of Sudbury. Take a look at that mining head frame, the white in the background, same place 28 years later. That's incredible. That's not animation, folks. That's the real thing. The last picture superimposed on the other. On the, on the other. This is your classic moonscape. You, I know it, it's hard to imagine that anything can grow here. Same place, and keep an eye out for the radio antenna, 28 years later. What the pioneers who came up with regreening didn't think of were all of the spin-offs. Let me give you an example. In 1990, somebody said, geez, we're doing a great job with reconstructing, restoring the ecosystem. Let's bring back some creatures that we haven't seen here in decades. So the first attempt was peregrine falcons. Over a four-year period, 75 peregrine falcons were released in the Sudbury area. Hundreds of volunteers were used to keep an eye on the offspring as they came off the nest off the university buildings. And to this day, their offsprings, offsprings, offsprings return to the Sudbury area. Peregrine falcons are short-lived, so we're not seeing the original ones. We're seeing multiple generations. Last year, a nest was discovered on a building that was going to be uh, demolished on Valet property. A peregrine falcon moved in there, a pair, and raised their young. They stopped the demolition. And two summers ago, one pair set up a nest on the cliff face of a quarry, and operations were suspended until the offspring were raised. So they keep returning. The Killarney peregrines were from the offsprings re-released two generations ago. Trumpeter swans, they were hunted out in Ontario over 100 years ago. So somebody said, let's bring back trumpeter swans. But to do that properly, you have to imprint the swans onto an ultralight because they have to be shown where to overwinter. I think some of you know the story of Father Goose. This is exactly the example. And sure enough, today we have trumpeter swans who are returning not to the same lakes necessarily, but all around Sudbury, and some of them are nesting here. Elk, the last elk was shot in Ontario in 1893, south of North Bay. That's documented. And again, people thought, well, if we could bring back these other creatures and restore the ecosystem, surely we could bring back elk. The elk that you see in Alberta is exactly the same species we used to have here. And today, we have a small, sustainable population the south end of the city, in the Burwash area. I have to talk about Junction Creek. So this creek that runs through the center of town, 12 years ago, a group of volunteers got together and said, People used to fish for brook trout in Junction Creek. I actually talked to two old-timers who remember in the 40s going out of their backyard in the Donovan area and fishing for brook trout. I found that hard to believe because the creek I grew up with was called Junk Creek. So these volunteers, over the last 12 years, have removed over 50 tons of garbage, restored vegetation on the shoreline, actually planted trees so we could have shade, and in some parts of the creek, there are brook trout. The, committee, the committee's role is absolutely crucial in that they reach out to young people, not only to educate them about what's going on, but the young people themselves are doing the work. One of the happiest bits of news was last summer, somebody spotted a very rare turtle in the Junction Creek watershed. It's a Blanding's turtle. It's an endangered species here. This summer, the committee has hired two people who, with the cooperation of the Ministry of Natural Resources, will track down these Blanding's turtles and put a transmitter on them to find out, are these turtles living here or are they just passing through? Irrespective to think that a city that looked like the moon would be home to an endangered species, I think that's a real feather in our cap. This is the Sudbury of today. The moonscape has evolved to the city of lakes. And of the 330 lakes, almost every lake today has fish. You could go fishing in almost every single one of them. The air regulations and 
the uh, diminishing of the sulfur from the super stack has been almost 95% since the 1960s, a reduction of sulfur by 95%. So the air quality has improved dramatically. But we, what we discovered is that as we regreen the landscape, the water quality has come back. Who would have thought that Sudbury would become a major tourist destination? I can't help but think that as the landscape from Sudbury became green again, we changed the way we looked at ourselves. And not only did the green landscape change, but the business landscape change as well. We see business today that we never would have imagined 30 years ago. If you look back at this tremendous success, what would you say were the key things that made it possible? First, the pioneers like Keith and other people who came up with the vision of what Sudbury could be didn't keep it to themselves. They shared the vision with the community. Next thing, they created opportunities where citizens can go out and actually do the work themselves. So the work wasn't left to a committee. We all, people my age here, have planted trees as part of the regreening program. So that the regreening program, when we say the Sudbury regreening program, it's not just some group's project. All Sudburyans are proud of it because most of us have been a part of that. It's ours, we own it. And lastly, build on the success. The regreening program and its success created hope, and that hope fueled other projects that came along afterwards. So what about you? What's your role in all of this? We can't change the past. We can't change history. But you can influence the future. You and I live today. You and I make decisions every single day. And we have to remind ourselves that at the end of every day, we make history. As each day passes, we leave a legacy for us and for those who will come after us. The truth is, if you want to change the world, it really doesn't matter what position in life you have, how much money you have or don't have, or how young you are or how old you are. The reality is, each and every single one of us has the power to positively influence the world around us, in a small way or in a big way. Collectively, that power, that influence, is enormous. The regreening of Sudbury is an example of that. We live in a world that is constantly changing. We live in a landscape that is constantly changing. And what I've tried to do with my presentation is create hope in a changing landscape. Thank you.